we're going to walk through and we're going to be reading the text as we study it this morning. So the other option you have is I just want to read our passage. But, you know, when scripture was first delivered to the churches, it actually wasn't read. It was heard. Uh, there was only one copy, one letter, and not everyone in the congregation could even read. And so it, these letters were written to be read and heard. And so you have permission to not necessarily follow along your Bible right now. If you just want to close your eyes and let the words kind of rush through your ears and maybe they'll hit you a little differently. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 9 through 14. For this reason also... Since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May the Spirit bless our study of the Scriptures this morning. Uh, I want to start out with asking a question that you don't need to answer aloud, uh, although most of the time you're welcome to answer aloud in our services. I don't mind that at all. Um, but I just want you to think about it as we jump into walking through these few verses this morning, what is eternal life? It's really critical that we not simply be aware of, in general, the definitions that may be given for eternal life. And I understand that even hearing that phrase makes it seem like you don't even have to ask the question. It seems self-explanatory. But, but think about if someone was speaking to you as, 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 as someone who doesn't share your faith tradition or your theology, and we're to ask you about what that means, that we're wanting to understand it, how would you, as owning it for yourself, you're not wanting to talk like you're talking from a dictionary or a textbook, you're just wanting to explain to it what does it mean, what is eternal life? And I, I think that, in general, certainly I would, it would be a pretty simple question to answer. It means when you die, you keep living. Um, luckily, uh, we get to trade in these models uh, of our bodies. I mean, some of you aren't looking forward to that. I, for one, am. Um, and we get to trade in this, bo th th this model and get something else. But our consciousness or our spirit or our soul, whatever language you want to use, it continues on. And eventually we're given a physical body that fits us for life in uh, heaven or eternity. But the point of it would be that eternal life is what happens, it means you keep living after you die and you never die, that you go on living forever. And so when we talk about eternal life that way, what we're mostly doing is we're using the word eternal as a quantitative word. In other words, it references time, it references longevity. So it's quantitative uh, because when I say eternal life means endless days. Now, even though I'm talking about transcending time, my reference point is still time, right? It just means time that doesn't stop, time that doesn't end, years that never end, a life that never ends. What, what I would like for you to consider uh, is, um, not because it's my opinion, but because what the scripture teaches is that eternal life is not primarily a quantitative word. Eternal life is actually a qualitative word. In other words, it's not just speaking of life that never ends, but the kind of life that never ends. And therefore, eternal life is something we begin to walk in and experience right now. We don't wait until after we die to begin to experience eternal life. We begin to walk the, the we begin to live in the quality of eternal life the moment we see and understand and embrace God's forgiveness and God's love and we respond with faith, we respond with a willingness to change our lives according to his ways. And as we do, this is what the Bible calls repentance. And as we do that, we actually, you, your faith ought to impact your quality of life. And if you have settled for faith, 
that has no bearing on your quality of life. It simply makes you feel more confident about what might happen if you, quote, got hit by a bus today. Then you're looking for something else to actually bring you quality of life. Either a habit or a person or a career or gain or some sort of philosophical or ideological system that will make sense. But you're not looking to Jesus for that. You look for Jesus to take care of what happens after you die. But is following Jesus having f bearing fruit in your quality of life? Because that's what eternal life is. That's where we, that's where we should see a, a transformation taking place that makes it unnecessary for me to chase after lesser idols. I, see, I don't get past chasing after lesser idols by disciplining myself to stop chasing after lesser idols. I get free of my lesser idols whenever I have Christ, the living Christ in his proper place at the center of my life. When that happens, life is a pursuit of beauty. It is not an avoidance of evil. And it is so much better to be pulled by beauty than it is to be repelled by evil. It's a much easier way to live. You, you know, gravitational pull is what we fight against. And if we're going to get free of gravitational pull, then we have to have engineers and really smart people that can teach us how to, to, to fight against gravity and get ourselves up in the air, either through airplanes or through rocket ships, whatever. But we all know enough to know what happens once you get out of this atmosphere this lower atmosphere what happens gravitational pull compels you it becomes the thing that is for you not the thing you're fighting against I would submit to you that too many people get tired of their Christianity or their faith because they constantly are living as though they're having to constantly fight and resist whether it's their own flesh, their own sin, or it's the ideological enemies that they have all around us, and those are increasing by the day in contemporary America. And so that is not how we're intended to live. And if we live our spirituality that way, we are going to get tired and burnt out, and we're going to lose faith. We should be living above this atmosphere where what's motivating us is the pull the pull of the beauty of Christ, the pull of the generosity of God, the pull of what it looks like to imitate God by being, walking, being a walking example of mercy and forgiveness. Now, this kind of life will not wear us out. In fact, it will invigorate us, and I would suggest it brings greater glory to God. How do we switch that? Well, let's let Jesus define it for us. In John 17 which is uh, uh, maybe titled in your Bibles as the high priestly prayer. It's the moment we have a recorded prayer that Jesus prayed for his followers. And we look at verses one through three, it says this. Jesus spoke these things and looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you gave him all authority over Christians. Right? Isn't that how we're taught to read this verse? But that is not what it says, is it? It says, since you gave him authority over all people. So that, and here's why. So he can rule over them? Well, yes, but that's not the primary motive. The primary motive is for Jesus to rule over us so that he can give us something that we can't get on our own. Look at this. Since you've given him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you've given him. I'm not even going to go into that too much. I'm going to let you put that in your theological pipe and smoke it this afternoon. So that, you may, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you've given him. And this is eternal life. That they may know this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and the one you have sent Jesus Christ eternal life is not living forever eternal life is knowing God through knowing the one he sent Jesus Christ 
And it is not being a Christian and mastering information about Jesus. That's what we tend to call discipleship in America. That's not what Jesus said. It's not mastering information about Jesus. It is in knowing God through knowing Jesus. That is eternal life. In other words, this is, real, this is, this is a relational reality. Now, please hear me and hang with me, and we're going to shift into Colossians in just a minute, and so you, you can uh, fantasize about your roast for a few seconds then. I'm going to as well. But this word no is very important because in the Greek, it comes up again in the passage that we're talking about. Same Greek word that's used right here in this verse. Now, bear with me. I'm not trying to be weird, but that same word is also the word that Mary uses whenever the Holy Spirit, uh, or I mean, Gabriel says that you're going to uh, bear a child and you are to call the same Emmanuel for he will save his people from their sins. And she says, how can this be? Because I have never known a man. Now I know I just potentially made it real weird real quick. So let me pull out of this. The point is, and we have this too, we have a word. We have words that mean different things in different contexts. Uh, there's colloquials that we hear, uh, that we use like this all the time. Well, the same is true as Greek, in, in Greek. In other words, a word can have meanings beyond just one meaning. It has multiple meanings, and the way you determine what it means is by the context in which it's spoken. And so the point isn't that this word always means something like sexual intimacy. But what I am saying is that's what Mary is referring to because this word is, is a relational knowing. It is not an informational knowing. Not an informational knowing, a relational knowing. And that's what this word means. So it means that I cannot experience what Jesus is talking about by learning good theology and going to classes and filling out notebooks with information. Any more than I could leave my wife at the altar on our wedding day and say, I do, and then never really speak to her face to face and only know her through letters for the next 10 years. I'm not gonna know her in the same way that I know her if I live with her and we grow in intimacy. And that's why marriage is the primary metaphor for the spiritual life in the New Testament. Because it, it is not talking about affirming a body of doctrine. It is talking about an experience that is relational to its core. And so that is what this word, or this begins to touch on what uh, the fullness of this word might mean. So then we look at this verse, verses 9 through 14. Now, if you've ever studied this verse, if you've got a more modern translation where the translators knew that modern readers aren't used to, to reading sentences this long. I mean, back in the day, they wrote sentences this long. Go read some Shakespeare, go read some Puritans. Oh my gosh, you just wanna fall on your pencil reading some of the sentences that the, that the Puritans would put together. Um, but this, in the Greek, this is like, this is a really long sentence. And it, and it goes through like three or four verses for one sentence. And, and so as I was looking at it, uh, I literally, I found myself getting lost in it and the way I prepared for this uh, teaching this morning is I just took and I just wrote the verses out one phrase at a time. So I could see them all there and be like, okay, this is a sentence that is full of modifiers and declarations. There's actually only one request in this long sentence. Although it looks like there are multiple requests in this, in, this, in this verse, there isn't. There's one request, and then there is this litany of modifiers and explanations to that request or what it looks like whenever God answers that request. So what is the request? Well, first of all, he says here in verse 9, Oh man, I see I edited this and I thought, gosh, we're gonna get through this in half an hour. And now I'm like, ugh. But verse nine, he says, for this reason. I had a whole thing we were gonna do on for this reason. Partly because I knew Nan Mae was gonna be in the room and she is a um, inductive Bible teacher and she really has helped me understand why that phrase is so important. However, we don't have time for that this morning, so let's move on. But for this reason, also, no, we're going to do it. So for this reason, okay, um, 
Gotta get, gotta get ready for this now. Uh, this thing's killing me. For this reason, I love this. Why, why does Paul say that? He says it because of everything we looked at last week. So essentially it's this. He says, for this reason, because the gospel, we've heard about your faith in the gospel, that it is growing and bearing fruit. What fruit is being born? What, do you re anybody remember? Love, love. He said, we've heard about your love for all the saints. The gospel's bearing fruit because we heard about your love for the saints. And for that reason, I've never stopped praying for you. I am stunned by this because what I realized when I read that this week is that primarily I pray from a negative mindset. In other words, I see something in my life that I don't want, or I see an obstacle on the horizon that I want to get past. And so my prayer life is, God, deliver me from this. God, help me to stop, do this. God, give me the power to overcome that. And what was staggering about Paul is what he said is, when I see fruit, then my prayer is to bless it and to pray for more of it. And I realized I have never, ever my entire life prayed that way. For one thing, I am so steeped in shame-based religion that the skill of evaluating my life and saying, you know what, that's gotten better. I've gotten better. The Spirit has borne fruit and made me better. I really don't do that very often. But what Paul is saying is, what he's modeling is that not, to, not that we can't pray against things, I'm not saying that, but that what he's modeling here is not a negative posture of prayer. It's a prayer time, paradigm that's very positive. I see what the Spirit is doing and I'm gonna verbally bless it in prayer and ask for its increase. So when we see the fruit of the gospel, we don't sit back and say, job well done. We're supposed to be gluttons for the fruit of the Spirit and say, more, Lord, more. I see what the Spirit is doing. I see the fruit that's being born. I bless it and I say, Lord, may that increase. Whether I'm praying for myself, I'm praying for this church, I'm praying for our community, or I'm praying for you as individuals. My, what I wanna do is be able to see what the Spirit's doing and say, God, bless that. Do more of that, God. That's exactly what Paul's doing here. Because we see the fruit of the gospel, because of that, that's why we're praying for you. And he says, for this reason, since we've heard this, uh, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Now, the reason why these kinds of sermons are so challenging is when we see a phrase like filled with the knowledge of God's will, we have multiple definitions that we're immediately throwing upon that. And most of our definitions actually aren't defined by scripture and, it's not def and, and they're not defined by what was modeled by the life of Jesus. They're defined by the limited religious, denominational, cultural assumptions that have been passed down to us. So some of us might read, be filled with the knowledge of God's will like he doesn't want instruments to be used in church. Some of us might read, be filled with the knowledge of God's will, things like he doesn't really want you dancing. Um, and then the charismatic movement hit and, hit, and then worship, new worship styles hit among those churches, and so we had to redefine. Well, I don't know. Dan you can clap, maybe you raise your hand, but you can't. I don't know what that means exactly, but you can't dance. I know what it means for me because my sensuality comes out when I'm dancing, so that's why it's not good, but... Well, you might mean that means, you know, there are certain words that you can't say. Or it means that you, things like you shouldn't drink alcohol or things like you should. But you see what we've done there. We're, we're allowing our man-made cultural assumptions to, 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 to define the scriptures for us. And the scriptures were not written to Christians. And they certainly were not written, well, no, I shouldn't say that. They, they weren't written to modern evangelicals. They were written for us, but not to us. So the same assumptions that we have, these are not in the minds of the authors while they're writing and penning these words. So if we wanna really understand what they're talking about, we've gotta let the text itself define what it means to be filled with the knowledge of, us, as, of his will. And what we have learned from the passage so far, if we just let the letter itself define that, it means walking in the ways of God so that you bear fruit and grow. That's what it means. It's not about your private denominational morality standards. No, 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 no. It just means 
You're learning and understanding the ways of God, walking in his ways, and as a result, you are bearing fruit and you are growing. That, that's what Paul is, is asking that they will have a revelation of. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. And look at this. He adds these modifiers in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, which means he's talking about something more than intellect. He's not talking simply about an intellectual knowing. He's talking about a relational knowing. He's talking about something that doesn't bypass intellect. That's not what I'm saying. I am not in any way anti-intellectual. But what he's saying is in the spiritual life, you don't experience it until these thoughts go beyond just the intellectual. You've got to have spiritual understanding into what it means to walk in the ways of God. And that's exactly what I'm praying for because I know that if you're filled with that kind of knowledge of God's will and wisdom and understanding, then you will be empowered to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And I love that word walk. That word walk uh, in the Greek, it means to walk. So sometimes it's not all that impressive to read the Greek lexicon. But what you do see from the Greek lexicon is metaphorically the way this word was used by the Hebrews was it referred to the ethics of one's life. So to walk means how I live. So when Paul says, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, what he is saying is so that you would conduct your life in a manner worthy of the Lord. So that you would live your life in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. When we come to know things, to grow in our skill and knowledge, there are basically three elements to what it means to come to know something. There's the revelation, the interpretation, and the application. The revelation is just the information. Now, if I'm talking about the spiritual life, maybe I'm talking about supernatural revelation that, you know, you're studying or you're going about your life and the Holy Spirit just speaks to your heart, speaks to your spirit and reveals something. That's one way, but it really doesn't even have to be that mystical. It might just mean you were driving to church, you put on your podcast and you heard an idea that you hadn't thought about before. So new information has come into the realm of your thinking. So there's that revelation part. We all experience that. Secondly, then there's the interpretation. So if the revelation is, what is it? Interpretation answers the question, what does it mean? So we take this information and we're synthesizing it and we're thinking about the, uh, the implications of it and we're judging the merits of one interpretation approach over another interpretational approach. And that's part of the process of growth as we interpret. But, but as we're judging the merits of other interpretations, what we're doing is, we're doing the hard work of coming up with our own interpretations. I think that one of the challenges to contemporary evangelical discipleship is, not, is that's where we think we've done our work. If we've heard it and talked about it, if we've challenged someone else's wrong interpretation on social media, if we've gotten in debates about it and squashed our opponent, if we've gone to home group and answer the question, what does this mean to you? Okay, this is what God expects of us. And this is killing us. It is making us pathetic and anemic because there's a third movement to knowing. After revelation and interpretation, you have to move to application. I think home groups should just be places we go where we encourage each other to apply what we've learned rather than being discussing the topic. Because something happens to us mentally when we discuss the topic, then we've shut the notebook and we're like, okay, we've mastered that. Well, no, you haven't. And until you've lived it and done it and allowed the living of it to bear its own witness into your life, you haven't done anything with the information. That is how actual learning works. That's how professional skill works. And that is how spiritual learning works. You don't have mastery until you practice. So there's revelation information, but then there is the application. Until I apply what I have learned, my knowledge will be incomplete. Spiritual knowledge is limited until I practice it. Now, I, some of you might not have this concern, but I spent a long time trying to figure out how to communicate this 
so that people didn't think that I was preaching legalism and workspace righteousness. Because what I've learned is in evangelical churches, if you talk about the stuff that Jesus commands us to do, people think you are now teaching legalism. Um, that's, a, that's a topic for another discussion. But what I'm trying to say is, I am not saying that your status with God is dependent on your behavior. I am saying that your experience of the fruit of the gospel is dependent on your behavior. It will ebb and flow based on the choices we are willing to make and how we respond to the truth we've received. So until I apply it, I don't really understand it. And then we have all these modifiers in verse 10b and following. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance in the saints of light. End of sentence. Now, if we lay these out, it might look like this, and I put that for you in your notes. What Paul is communicating, that as the Spirit answers his prayer, and that we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, we are then empowered to walk in his ways. That's the point. I just don't think that God is going to welcome anyone into heaven and say, you are blessed because your theology was better than everyone else's. But for some reason, we make that the important standard. No, what we're being empowered to do is not just know things, but to walk in his ways. Now, once we're empowered to walk in his ways, there are, there's fruit that is born. There are results. There are consequences. And those are, we will please him. We will bear fruit in our lives. We will be growing, which means we are constantly growing until we transition to the other side. And perhaps, we don't know, we probably will be on growing throughout eternity, but that's a topic for another time. We're going to be empowered. We are going to have endurance. We're going to be able to stay the course in the face of difficulty and trial. We are going to have patience. And by that, it's, again, this is another one of those things that we've got to talk about. Patience, the way we understand patience, it's terrible. Because the way we have such a pathetic definition of patience, typically when I say the word patient, what I mean is help me to not be so irritated with all the dumb people around me. (laughs) Right? That's what we mean to say, God, give me patience. You have cursed me to be wise among fools. I feel that a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. (laughs) But that's not... That's a, that's a truncated idea of patience. What if patience has nothing to do with how you respond to people that irritate you, but if patience is intended to be a characteristic of the way you live your life? What if it means that when we're filled with the knowledge of the ways of God, we live calm and unhurried lives? How many of you would say, if knowing Jesus could lead me to live a calm and unhurried life, how many of you would say, if that's true, that experience would greatly increase the quality of my life? I I yearn so deeply for that. I want that more than I want to be instantly delivered from the temptations of all my worst sins. What I want, I just turned 49. I know I'm on the back end of my life and I just don't want to experience it like I did the front end. I I want to live a calm and unhurried life because of the gospel bearing the fruit of patience in my life. So, So we will have patience. We will have joy and gratitude And we will have an awareness of the inheritance that we share with all the saints of God. Now, that's the result. So, let's end by going back to the first verse. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will 
in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It might be helpful if you glance at your notes here because I wanted to put these things down on paper for you. Again, this word knowledge, if you're looking at your Greek lexicon, what you're looking for, you see it says epigenosis. Well, what you're really, and you'll see it when you look at the lexicons if you ever are nerdy enough to want to do that. They're free online now. I used to, you'd have to have these huge libraries. You don't have to do that anymore. But what we're wanting to understand is this root word gnosis. Epi is a prefix. So gnosis is, is, is the idea. Gnosis is the word that Mary used, as I was referencing earlier. Gnosis is the word that um, um, a Jesus used when he says what it means to know God. Paul says epigenosis, but the same thing, all it's doing, it has a prefix that's making it actually more intense. And what that word means is not just information. It, it means perception and discernment. And look at this, it means intuition. It means that the, your knowledge of God isn't just here. It's, it's here and it's here. It just, oh, it's right here. It's very intuitive. It's present. It's dwelling in me. And if I would learn the practices that allow me to be aware of the presence of God that's right here, then I'm walking into the knowledge that he's talking about. It's not just, I'm going to make a list and list the pros and cons. It's even if I make the list and I make the pros and cons and the paper says, don't do it. But the spirit says, no, you've got to do this. Yes, it's risky. I never promised you that it would be safe. And it's not going to match what came out on your intellectual chart when you did the pros and cons. But you know, people around you may not know, they may not know, but you know, that's, that's how we're called to live our lives. That's the knowledge of God's will. It's that intuitive inner lucidity that gets birthed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how we're, we were supposed to be attuned to that. We're supposed to respond to that. It's intuition. In fact, the word study helps on the internet says that it means knowledge gained through firsthand relationship. It's experiential uh, knowing. And then the wisdom it talks about, this wisdom is the, the Greek word we're probably more familiar with, Sophia. And it, and it doesn't just mean wisdom. Look at this. It means skill. And I like that. And I want you to hang out for just 30 seconds on that idea. Paul's saying that you will be skillful in the ways of God. You see, not just that you'll be aware of it, but you will be skillful in living out the ways of God. It means skill. It's the art of actually being able to use wisdom. Walking worthy of the Lord is a skill that we must patiently develop. It's one of the double meanings of what it means to practice your faith. It doesn't just mean do it. It means do it in such a way that you're open to learning how to do it better. Not being afraid of the fact that you do it immaturely or imperfectly. Those aren't excuses to not practice. You give yourself permission to practice and do it in a way that's not so great. Or to practice and to fail and to continue to get up and continue to practice. It, 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 it's, it's skill in applying that wisdom it's a skill that we develop over time. And then it says that, I also pray that you not just have, that you not know God's will with all wisdom, but spiritual understanding. Spiritual, it's relating to the realm of the spirit. So, so he's talking about a knowing that's beyond just information in the intellect. It's something from the gut. And understanding simply means putting it together in the mind. It's, it's a practical discernment. In other words, the point isn't to discuss the complexity of your ideological system that allows you to articulate your interpretation of the knowledge of the will of God. That, that's not what this is referring to. What it's talking about is being able to practically live it out, walking in the ways of God. This is why You can know more about the heart of God by forgiving your spouse than you'll ever get out of attending lectures on the book of Colossians. Because the information in the lecture has potential, but it's not power there. It's only powerful in the living of it. I don't want to go too far over, but 
it's just great story, and I didn't prepare for it, so this is a little spontaneous, and so if I get my details wrong, please forgive me. Uh, you can go to the Google this afternoon and clarify the story. But I don't know how many of you are aware of Corey Ten Boom. Her, her, her story is remarkable, remarkable. She is, I don't talk about her a lot, but she is one of the primary heroes in my own thought system, in my own reference point, for, for several reasons. But she writes about an experience that, here's, here's the problem with knowing here, but not here. She writes about an experience that I really can't comprehend. And it was when she was giving a lecture, if you don't know her story, just roughly the backstory, she, was a, she, was, she hid Jews during Nazi Germany and so she was put in concentration camps with her family and her sister died in one of those uh, tr- concentration camps after being humiliated, losing all dignity and she finally lost, she got sick and she died in the concentration camp. And when you read Corey's story about the conditions of that, it's just, it's just dreadful, it's incomprehensible to me because I've lived such a comfortable life, frankly. And so she talks about years after that when she was out, she was in a Christian meeting and she was giving a lecture and one of the officers from the constant, who was in the concentration camp where her sister died, who had in fact humiliated her sister. She looks out and he's sitting in the audience listening to her teach about the gospel. And the meeting is over and he starts to make his way toward her. And, and she writes about it. She writes about this war that goes on in her heart because she knows that what God calls her to is forgiveness, but she knows she does not feel forgiveness. There is hate, there is woundedness, there is bitterness there. And so she's having this conversation with herself as he's walking toward her. And as he comes up, what she finally decided was this, I can't forgive him. I just can't do it. I can't force my heart to feel what it doesn't feel. I can make a choice to shake his hand and choose to act forgiving. And so that's what she does. So here she has this knowledge up here. Yes, you should forgive. And here the information is opposite what's up here. She says she reaches out and when she touched his hand, she felt a physical manifestation run up her arm. I can't remember how she describes it. I want to say electricity, but I don't remember. But she, she felt, and what she interpreted as, it was a gift of the grace of God. Because when she felt that manifestation run up her arm, her heart was changed. And so now, there's a knowing that she had up here that she acted upon, but the living it caused her to know it right and, and I think of that story often because I always thought you needed to feel it before you acted on it. That is not the case. In fact, you can't understand the commands of Christ until you practice them. Not really. You can parse out the words, go to the Greek lexicon like I did and read original Greek definitions, but that's not knowing. It is when you practice it and it bears its fruit in your life. So, as we get ready to close, the worship team can make their way forward. I want to leave you with a process. Um, it does it, you don't have to make it your process, but I would encourage you to try to make it your process. But maybe we need to pattern our lives around the movements of lear- awareness, learning, reflecting, and acting. Awareness, learning, reflecting, and acting. So that, so that we understand how deep of a calling it is to know the ways of God. It's not just that we are aware, but it begins there. The problem with with awareness is if you don't have it, you just don't know that you don't have it because you're unaware. And so awareness actually begins with humility to say, to move to the place of prayer and say, Holy Spirit, will you open up my eyes to my blind spots? Show me the things that I ought to know, but I'm unaware of them. Begin to move in my heart, in my thinking, in my thoughts. I give you my intellect, and I give you my heart, and I ask you to glorify yourself by speaking to those realms of my soul where I'm completely unaware, either of foolish decisions that I'm making or I'm unaware of wisdom that you're calling me to walk in. 
Be willing to acknowledge your growth in the spirit and examine your potential blind spots. You know, Proverbs gives us the encouragement, wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. So this whole journey begins with the humility of admitting, I really don't know all that I need to know. I don't understand all that I need to understand. I need a power bigger than myself to speak revelation and enlightenment into my heart. So we grow in awareness. And so then as God speaks to us, we go to learn. How do we learn? We read. And you know what? I've, I've transitioned to now that I've been fully converted to Audible. Reading counts if you're just listening to it. So, so, so you get your information. Maybe you do that. Maybe you find a podcast that in this season of your life, it just speaks to you. But I think what's even better is to call up a friend and eat a spicy chicken sandwich and let's talk about, these are the questions I have. Or maybe because you live in community, I'd like to see something in Mike that I'm convicted of. And I'm like, this guy has figured something out that I, hasn't, I haven't figured out. Mike, can we get together? I am, I am trying to understand this. Tell me how this has been fleshed out. And now we're going beyond what you can get out of a textbook. book. We're sharing our lives together. And God is present there. Where two or three are gathered, now God is there. And so God is expanding that learning, but it's, it's relational. So I have conversations, or maybe I go for a walk, and I take time to prayerfully meditate. I open up my journal, and I begin to work things out. Like C.S. Lewis said, get your journal, or get, get your pencil, or, uh, what do he say? A pipe in your teeth and a pencil in your hand. I like that. If you're more conservative, you can skip the pipe. Uh, but then finally, we recognize, and I don't know if I can communicate this ac- accurately, develop the skill and the habit of proactively and purposefully living what you were learning. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you opportunities to practice what he's teaching. And all of a sudden, you're gonna start living a different kind of life because you're gonna be more present and you're not gonna be living solely from the dialogue that's taking place up here. We've talked about that, that free flow, that streaming conversation that's always happening. Instead of from here, you're gonna start living by the conversation that's going on in here. It's a conscious choice. It doesn't happen by accident. But this is how we learn the ways of God. And we start responding in real time to the life of the Spirit, to the power of the Spirit. And we live transformed lives that are of a better quality of life than they would be if we weren't following Jesus as our Lord.